Did you hit record? I think that I'm going to reverse the um, role of the agenda, and the first item will be to introduce to you the new director of the CDC, Mike Lawler. Uh, Mike, would you like to come up and stay up here? I know um, I heard today, too, that uh, congratulations are in order that you've been awarded a three-year contract. Is that right? Well, congratulations to you, and I know Jim would like to say a few things. I just congratulations, Mike. Uh, I've enjoyed working with you in the past, and now in both our new roles, I enjoy to continue uh, working with you. That some of you might not know who Mike is, I've asked him to uh, be prepared to give a little bio background of who he is. He's been around a lot longer than some of you may think. So again, congratulations, Mike, and go ahead. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Uh, before I, Jim asked me to speak tonight, um, I had to think about it for a minute, and it's hard to believe this is actually my 15th school year as I'm starting at the CDC. Uh, I've lived in Bennington for 17 years, uh, graduate of Southern Vermont College, uh, also an Oregon University up in Northfield, and I'm excited to, uh, to continue. I taught for 12 years at the CDC, um, the law enforcement program primarily, which is now a, a full-fledged program uh, that has full enrollment, which is great. Uh, two years, assistant director the previous two years, and then this year, uh, director, and now it's director superintendent. So uh, I'm excited about the position. I'm excited to work with uh, the elementary schools. We're partnering with the middle school. Uh, we've built really strong relationships with the high school, uh, and we're excited to continue with that. So I think any questions? Well, have any? <clears throat> welcome. Does anybody have any questions for Mike? Well, I look forward to a long and, and uh, productive relationship between these two, and I hope that you'll keep us all informed as to what's happening. I know there are a couple items on the agenda that relate to the relationship or the working together between the high school and the CDC and the middle school. So uh, we look forward to that continue. Great. Thank you very Welcome. much. Thanks. <clears throat> we'll now go over into public comments. Are there any uh, people in the public who would like to address the board? If not, we'll move on then. <clears throat> the first item on the agenda is the finance. We have a number of bids to award. Uh, we, the treasurer's report was included. Generally speaking, what we do with that, we just have a motion to accept the treasurer's report and vote on it. Do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? We can move on then. We have two... <clears throat> we have two... Um, uh, awards for one for heating oil and one for diesel. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to bring up the comments on the on our new web page. So maybe somebody, Rick, who who are the individuals and what's the price? Who are the individuals? Well, I just was going to say who are the individuals and who are we awarding it to? Oh, I, I have it right here. Actually, one for. Um, Fuel oil, which is also the diesel. The other one's for the propane. We use a lot of propane up here in the kitchen, as well as um, both facilities for uh, various generators and stuff that get um, get used. And we had a number of bidders on both, and the low bid, which is our recommendation, has been the vendor we've had for the last few years for both products. Okay, very good. So we, let's take a motion. Let's do them separately. Sears, right. The first for the diesel fuel. It's just that everybody need to know that was Sears that was on there was the bidder that we all. Well, C Sears is for your big tanks, and yeah. West Oil is for your small tanks. Yeah, so they won't deliver to the small ones. <clears throat> that's okay. right. This is this is for West Oil in the amount of basically 24 cents. So do we have a motion? So move. Second it. Any questions? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions for the propane. Well, you need to do, you need to do Sears for your um, for your big tanks. Okay. For the oil. So moved. Second it. I've not really just. Oh, I see. All right. Thank you. Uh, any questions? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Abstentions. Okay. We can move on then to the propane <clears throat> and synergy. Do we have a motion to accept that? So moved. It's for uh, Suburban. Oh, Suburban. I'm sorry. Yeah, yep. suburban. suburban. Thank you. Suburban, in the amount of 30, that would be 30 cents above the terminal price? Uh, correct. 30 cents above the terminal price. Do we have a motion? So we made it. Okay, very good. Uh, any questions? 
All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or extensions? That's good. Thank you. Any questions on the budget status report? If not, we can move on then. We can move on to the consent agenda. We have a motion to accept it. So moved. Second. Second. Third. Any questions on that? Leon? The field trip is only eight students. Why so few? There is one for the high school, and it's only eight students. That's all in the class? The suburban, I mean, no, the what is the field trip? Because I can't get my phone open. Uh, show them. <laughs> uh, Okay. You can't get uh, it. This is the Chevron Museum. I can't get it either. <laughs> and there's only uh, eight eight Those students are going. An advanced, I think it's the Advanced uh, Graphic Arts Group. It is so for Barbara Aiken. and 12, yeah. Bob Ackerman. That's yeah. the I just wondered why the numbers were so low, that's all. And if, if it's eight is that. It's because it's a few of very advanced kids going to a particular thing. Okay, we got it. That's all I have. Any further questions on that? If not, all in favor of the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Very good. We can then move on to the administrator's report. Why don't we start with Sue? Yes, I, I'm going to, we just talked about what we were going to present. Can I let Morgan present that part? And then sure. my part was going to be during our presentation. Yep. Okay, fine. Yep. Sure. Can we combine your report with this report? Yep, that's Very fine. good. Yep. Um, well, first of all, the fall sports at the high school have been going um, pretty well. There's been a few injuries on um, a couple of different teams and a lot of really close games, but um, all in all, we've been doing pretty well. Both the Lady Patriot Soccer Tournament and the John James um, happened recently, and MAU took second in both. And the football team also um, recently won their first home game, so that was a plus. Um, in addition, the open house was at the high school last night and that went really well and the middle school's open house is tomorrow night. And next week at high school is Spirit Week and we have our pep rally on Friday that we have every year. Um, also this weekend there's a play at the high school. It's called Putnam County Spelling Bee and it's Thursday, Friday and Saturday. And lastly, the administration and the students have recently been working together and have created a plan for a dance that's going to take place in November. And um, the students are arranging like various types of music and uh, activities that are going to occur at the dance. So um, a lot of people are looking forward to that. Thank you very much. I'd like to congratulate the student body and the administration for the way they handled the situation that was Difficult, I'm sure, and, and hard for some people to accept. I certainly applaud the effort that you made and the courage you showed to be able to carry that through with, a, with the success that happened. And also for the students to, to gather behind the administration and show support for what they believed was the right thing to do, I believe it too, and also to come up with a program that is going to allow the students to have their dance. So I, I congratulate you all very much. Okay, Tim. Oh, I just repeat, uh, as I already said, we have our open house tomorrow evening, 6.30 to 8.30. We do a brief introduction in the cafeteria, and then we give folks an opportunity to visit with their core team and then move on to the unified classes. Uh, it's really, it really serves as an introduction to the school year. Um, it is not uh, parent-teacher conferences, as folks might be more familiar with at the elementary level. You can imagine 600 conferences in an evening is not a possible task. But we do encourage folks to make the introductions, connect, uh, collect emails and phone numbers with teachers, and start setting up those conversations if they would like to do that. But we will be hosting and providing some snacks and time to visit the building tomorrow. It should be fun. Very good. Tim and Sue both, <clears throat> we had talked last time about setting some goals for, uh, for your schools that would be measurable, things that we could take a look at now and see where you are and hopefully see uh, advancement, but at least uh, be able to see what you've done to, to meet those goals. Would either of you like to address? We're, go we're going to address that in the, in the superintendent report in the presentation that you're going to get uh, on the AYP on okay. the superintendent report. Both okay. That'll be part of their presentation. Then. Okay, that, that, that makes sense. Um, we can go on. We, the student representative report, I assume, is there's nothing more to add to that. I'd like to go have a ag committee report from Jim and Tim 
Uh, before we get started, I think the Ag Committee has done a very good job under Nathan's leadership. I do think, though, that we've reached a point with the Ag Committee where we have to become a little more organized, a little more businesslike in, in the way that it's done. The assignment of responsibilities, who is going to make decisions and how those decisions are going to be made. In, particularly in terms of uh, recommendations, remember committees make recommendations to the full board to be implemented. And I, I think it's important that we follow, we follow that general procedure. So I've, I tried to get a hold of you earlier, Nathan, but maybe you and Tim and whoever else you want to be there could report at our next meeting on how we might pull that together so we get a little bit better idea about how the organization will work, who's responsible, and what the long-term agenda is. Two of my concerns are that there's a lot of effort in going into the, into the agricultural programs, which I applaud. But it's been our experience that, that that effort is usually concentrated upon two or three people. And once those people leave, then those programs seem to diminish in their importance and the, the amount of people follow. So I'd like to, for the committee to take a look at that. So we've got an organizational plan to see what would happen if, you know, when people leave or what the long-term goals are and that sort of thing. That's just a, a future assignment. And I've also asked um, uh, Nelson to um, get together with the appropriate people from the administration and so that we are a little bit better informed, at least I need to be better informed about the Chromebooks that we now have. And that number is, what, 600 and something? Rick, what is it? Well, that might be just a middle school. There's, we uh, have, plus we have 180 we just mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, it's a, it's a big number of Chromebooks that we're Probably doing. Probably over seven, 800. Seven or 800 Chromebooks that we're doing on a lease process. And I would just, I, I'd like to understand more about why we did it in, and what the long, once again, what the long-term uh, effects of that will be. In other words, after the, it's a three-year lease, as I understand it, Rick? Yes. A three-year lease. What happens then? Do we continue with it? Just so that we're a little bit better informed and what type of responsibility the students will have for those, <coughs> for those devices. If, uh, if they're damaged, what happens, that kind of thing. So do you want that as a presentation for the October meeting? Sure. Um, okay. Um, that would be great. Good. Just mm -hmm. to just to see how the I don't even know, for instance, can they take them home? Can't they take them right. home? We did that at one of the other boards, so we can do it for them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. Tim. Yes. I mean, you were you were speaking to the act, the Nathan, in yep. terms of your, uh, the goals and directions they're going in. I think one of the things that we spoke about earlier in in the program is that there was a bigger picture out there, and that relationship. You know, when we built this school, was supposed to have some a relationship with the Career Development Center. And so that should be part of the picture as well as to how those things are going to work through that program and because I think there may be more monies out there to be got for programs with efforts through that program. I mean, with, through that uh, particular, uh, um, the through the, through the uh, Career Development Center. You're going to hear more about that yeah. in a minute. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that that didn't get left out because that, that's some of the things that we said we were going to do when we, we built this building up here. And so we need to make sure that they play a real role in what we do because monies and all this other stuff coming in is going to come, my, I think, going to flow that way more so that's, than this way. That's right. Why don't we move on then to the Ag Committee? And I'm not sure Jim and Tim or Tim and Jim how the Dog and Pony Show is going to go. I think Tim is up first. <laughs> oh, I, I feel like I drew the yeah, short okay. stick. <laughs> yeah, his name have, listed first. Do you have a visual to provide for members? I, do. I have a couple of small ones. But... I have some hand drawn yeah, ones too. Me. I can be like Dana. I can, I can fold it a little bit so and we can just pass it around. It's kind of self-explanatory once it can get going. Uh, I think that the big picture, this might, we might get confused a little bit on that. All right. You want to just take a quick look at it? And just to remind people, one of the issues that we'll be discussing is the placement of a greenhouse, which the CDC is um, 
well, let them go on, but it's a placement of the greenhouse on the middle school property, where it's going to go, and who's going to be responsible for the... And we're going to, we're going to ultimately want two motions. One, to host the CDC's greenhouse, because it is theirs. Right. And two, where it's going to be located. Yeah. We can do that. And before I pass this around, uh, let me just explain there are, there are three structures called out on this print. Uh, one of them was one of the sites that was looked at for the greenhouse. There basically are two sites that have been looked at. Um, there also is the outdoor classroom site that is currently, uh, some of the site work has already started on it. And it's called out in yellow and the proposed greenhouse. The one that is more centered into the garden is the one I believe we're, we're uh, looking, looking at. The other one actually has an X through it. <laughs> so, um, as it goes around, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So, uh, for the purposes of the board and for the community that are watching this evening, we'll give you a really brief uh, history. I can do that in two minutes or less uh, and talk about two projects that are currently being uh, worked on on campus and then future plans which uh, will address some of the chair's uh, requests for information. So um, the greenhouse is a uh, is really a, an offer from the CDC which directly <coughs> connects to what we are trying to do at the middle school. We have a sustainability course that students in the seventh and the eighth grade take as part of their unified offerings. Uh, it's a mix of uh, tech department and uh, um, uh, applied tech, a workshop, a uh, kitchen, and a garden, a school garden. Uh, and in the two years that I've been at the building, there's always been discussion about the want for a greenhouse on campus. It would have really the benefit of extending the growing season in Vermont. It would allow students to get out into the garden earlier. It would allow them to uh, extend their activities in the garden later, so it would be a, a, a very positive for us. Of course, cost. Uh, greenhouses of good quality are expensive uh, and we talked about that for uh, a number of occasions in the Ag Committee. So when uh, Amanda uh, came to us from the CDC and said, look, I'm, I'm laying the groundwork for a sustainable livings course at um, the CDC, is there a connection? We jumped on that opportunity, absolutely, it'd be great, it'd be great to have high school students here, it'd be great for middle schoolers to start thinking about that as far as career and making connections to the CDC and the high school, it'd be awesome. Um, grant funded, uh, a lot of you know curriculum development for that course at the CDC, equipment purchases, things like that, all of which would benefit us, obviously, at the middle school. So in the course of discussing this with the agricultural subcommittee in the spring, the subcommittee said, absolutely, we think this is a great idea. And the greenhouse was, was purchased. Uh, it's a pretty sizable structure, uh, 30 feet by 70 feet. Uh, I can't give you all the tech because that's way above what my expertise is. But it's a pretty sizable structure and a pretty good quality structure. Uh, we've had some discussions. We've had some spirited discussions about where a structure like that would go uh, on the property. Uh, and we're trying to balance the needs of obviously folks whose expertise is in farming and folks whose expertise is in building and grounds and neighbors. Uh, we have met a few of the neighbors during this discussion piece and that's been good for us to uh, hear from as well. But trying to balance that as far as where you put a greenhouse of that size so that it can be the effective tool that you're looking for. You can't tuck this thing into the shaded part of the property or it doesn't do what we've said it was doing and that is extending the growing season. Uh, but you also, we realize, can't place it out by the flagpole uh, in full view of uh, you know, a multi-million dollar school. So we've had plenty of spirited conversations about that. Uh, the Ag Committee was very well attended two weeks ago. We had about 20 people. Um, I don't think I've seen more than six folks at meetings like that before, but it had lots of discussion and lots of uh, ideas being bandied around. And we were tasked as a smaller group to go out and make a suggestion. The, the position that is uh, that you'll see on the map is a compromise. It is absolutely a compromise between uh, you know a number of uh, suggestions, um, but in the end, the small group that uh, met and, and informed the ag committee was, look, this is a spot that we feel that we can work with. Um, 
it may not be ideal, but trying to be uh, honoring the neighbors and the building and the ag's needs, this is where we would like to go. So as Mr. Pembroke said, one thing we wanted to do was to update the board about where we are in that process. Um, there will be the need for motions to um, invite the CDC onto the property uh, and to support the you know, construction of a greenhouse. I would be remiss if I did not say that there's also work going on back in the garden as well. The CDC forestry and building trades group has been up here uh, thinning a hedge line where they will be placing a outdoor classroom. Um, I think we've talked about, the, some of you may not remember this, but a, a simple structure, six to eight poles with a roof over it, the idea that it would be a shaded space where students could go out, have class outside. Uh, this again was a uh, suggestion by the Ag Committee more than a year ago. Uh, we were trying to make a, a connection to the local dermatologist and a grant that would provide sunscreen for kids outside. Uh, and through the generosity of the Williams family uh, and a commitment on our part as far as some budget money, we were able to make that purchase. They are in the process of preparing that site. Uh, so, you know, tree, dead trees are being removed, bushes are being removed, the, the ground is being leveled. Uh, and uh, the next step, of course, would be to actually build the structure. So to also notify the board of that uh, in case, you know, you hear that in the community that you tractors are up there and dump trucks are moving around, things like that. Uh, the, the meeting that we had, the ag meeting, was well attended. Uh, we were pretty clear in our directions that, as the chair mentioned, this has become a very successful program, but it's a, it's a sizable commitment on the budget part. And as a result, it's time to start having uh, those less exciting things like a long-term plan, uh, a budgeting process, uh, a financing system that supports, uh, you know, taking in of grants, purchasing of equipment and seed, uh, paying individuals to care for this, uh, and, and that doesn't even bring in the long term of how do you sustain this. The program is really supported by several key folks. This is their passion. They started off as volunteers. I can't guarantee you that they'll be here in 10 or 15 years to run this program. Uh, retirements, moving on to other things. So I feel that it's time for us to have a plan on how do you keep this going because it is a pretty sizable project now at the front of the middle school and uh, we can't just let it fall down. It would be, it would definitely detract from the middle school and its appearance in the community. So I'd be glad to answer any questions or attempt to. Uh, <laughs> good. I, I think in the plan that you are going to design, it, it should be clearly stated who is responsible for the maintenance of this the how you divide the costs of whatever involved in, in the continuing uh, use of these facilities. And I, and I look forward uh, to you or whoever else is going to be working on it to come back to the board, hopefully by our next meeting or certainly in December, with, with a definite plan uh, outlining those things that both you and I have spoken about. Yeah, I wouldn't make an October promise. No, uh, December. But as I understand, be like I said, there's, uh, there's many years of history in this project. I think there has been long-term planning done in the past, so I think we're gonna, as part of that, we're gonna have to revisit that uh, and see what still works for us. We also had an individual named Liz Kenton. She is part of the UVM Ag Extension Program out of Brattleboro. She came and participated in a couple of conversations. She's available to us through December, uh, and she has offered to uh, facilitate those discussions and kind of help do the policy stuff. Like I said, all the not so exciting things we have to do. Very good. Are there any questions that the board has before we at least approach those two motions? One <clears throat> motion, as I understand it, is that this board has to approve uh, the CDC building a greenhouse on the on our on the middle school property here. Is that is that about what we need as far as anybody knows? Okay, I'll accept that motion then from so somebody. Moved. Do we have a second? second? Any discussion on that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, when we're accepting this, are we putting a timetable on the acceptance, or is it a lifetime? Is it uh, for a duration of, of what? I guess it's my question, if we don't have a plan on what we're doing yet, we're allowing a building to be built and put on the grounds mm -hmm. with no plan, uh, sort of, I don't know, it just strikes me as yeah. putting the horse before the cart a little bit. 
It, one thing I want to clarify, it's not a building, it's not a permanent structure, it's not on a foundation, it's on a compacted earth um, surface. So it could always be dismantled and moved. It's a, But uh, your point's well taken. I don't know what the maker of the motion's intent was for how long you envisioned this relationship or allowing allowing them to uh, erect a greenhouse on the site was for. I, I would like to amend that motion if I could to state that it is a temporary structure that can be easily moved, yeah. removed, you that see. we're granting permission for. Certainly, we can, we can do that. And that's why both Tim and, and I have, have felt that we need a plan and it's hard to vote on it if we don't have a plan, yeah. but we have to get one. So that motion has been amended. If, do uh, we have Fran, a- Fran, you agree to that? Yeah, I'll, and I'll accept yeah, yeah. that change as yeah. well. So, yep. All right. Uh, we have a motion then before that basically states that the that is, is a non-permanent structure. The board gives the permission to the CDC to build that structure. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Good. Now the second motion, Rick, is location. to is to approve the location as outlined um, by your facilities director. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. Do we have I'll a motion it. to I'll move it? Move it. Do we have a second? second? Okay. I just have a couple of questions. Do we have um, access to either water or electricity there? No. Not at this time. If 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 we do that, um, presently we use a hose and that kind of thing, don't we, for the things that are going on? And a water tank. And a water yep. tank, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yep. Um, is that a concern of those people that are directly involved with this greenhouse not having easy access to water? I would absolutely say across the board it's a concern. Um, I would couch it as an opportunity though as we started talking about seriously placing it uh, that, you know, um, and I won't speak for, for Jim, Jim can weigh in and not, but the idea, water is important to run a greenhouse obviously as is electricity. Uh, when we talked about both structures in their earliest talks, we didn't include water and electricity only because we felt that it would go into the permitting process and become just that much bigger of a, a project. Um, I, do, I am, to answer your direct question, there were absolutely concerns at the committee level about the lack of water and electricity. I do think we can address uh, the water issue. The electricity piece. I mean, honestly, uh, the opportunity that I see there, and it did come up in the conversation in the committee, is this would be an excellent place to do solar. Yeah. You know, you put a cell in or a two, and, you know, again, above my expertise of what kind of array you would need, but that would be an excellent opportunity. Sure. I just wanted to be sure that I know Jim is usually very thorough at the things like this, and I'm sure that he's explored, you know, what the opportunities are that are available to us for both those things, both the water and the electricity. I just wanted to assure the board that somebody has given it some thought and that, uh, you know, when the situation arises, uh, the committee or somebody will bring it before us. Yeah, the, there have been discussions uh, about a water supply being installed, and we've even gotten as far as discussing uh, trying to do it as this building is put up. But until we get all of the approvals and get the building located, uh, it's just preliminary discussions. Right. Fine. We have a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed or abstentions? Good. Is there anything else on that issue that you'd like to bring before the board? Good. We can move on then. <clears throat> um, There's no public comment on that? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm on I'm Alan Baker, I'm on the Ag Committee, and when you site a greenhouse with no no heat in it, other than sunlight, you probably want to put it where it got maximum sunshine. We have 16 acres of prime farmland here to put it on, and where it's currently sited, it's shaded on the east and it's shaded on the west, and it's also taking up some of the uh, middle school's asparagus plant, patch, which takes three years to establish. They may have to move some of the raised beds. If they move the whole thing 30, 40 feet to the south, a little bit to the east, you eliminate those problems. If you look at uh, Cornell's website on citing uh, hoop houses, it says avoid shade from trees or buildings as much as practical. 
Shade on the east side of the tunnel will promote morning wet leaf wetness and increase chances for foliar diseases. For fall crops, avoid shade completely as cool season crops need as much sunlight as possible during the short days with low sun. And at the bottom it says some farmers like to locate their tunnels with high visibility because if it's out of, you avoid the out of sight, out of mind troubles. So the more sun we get on it, the more successful CDC's fledgling program will be and not interrupt the, all the hard work that's been put into those gardens so far. And if we just move that, like I say, just out of the middle school garden area, just beyond their four by fours where they're putting up their deer fence and slightly to the east, you avoid all these problems and not take up all the hard work. I don't know, have you ever grown asparagus? It takes three years before you get a harvest. And to just take any of that is just it's just not right for all the hard work they put into the improving that land. So if we, and all the uh, professional farmers that looked at the site have said the same thing and their advice has been ignored. And I'm not sure why. Thank you. My, my opinion on that is we had an ag committee. We had the people that we entrusted with making that decision. And I'm, I have confidence that they reviewed the areas that you've discussed and they feel that this is the best location. I was on the subcommittee to go look at the site and we got there, it was already staked out and they wanted rubber stamped right where it was staked. We did not, as a group, go around and look for the best plight. We got there, it was all staked out, it was like, okay. why are we here? Okay, Tim, do you have something to add to that? And, and I, I want to assure the committee. There's a question for Well, the, the reason, Public comments are, are not for discussion. They are for to be listened to and referred back to the Ag Committee, and, 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 and that's based on our policies and procedures. So I would prefer that you thank Mr. Baker for the comments and ask the Ag Committee to, to take a look at that and, and, and come back with a response to you as the chair, if, if necessary, or whatever along that line, and we move on. Very good. We will, we will do that, Mr. Baker. We appreciate your effort and concern on this matter, and uh, Leon is, is right. We will send it back to the Ag Committee and have an answer for you at our next, uh, at our next meeting. Are there any other questions? Um, Jim? I'm a little confused as to where we stand on the motion that was made. And well, we've, no, we, it's passed. We've done it. It's, uh, the board okay, has approved yeah. the location, yeah. period. Any other? We can move on then. Um, get back here. Superintendent's report. Good evening. Um, the bulk of my report this evening is going to be done by the principals and by the new director of uh, of curriculum instruction assessment, Laura Boudreau, for the supervisory union. One of, when I reviewed last month's task list, which is, I, I keep a running list of what you're requesting during the meeting. One of the things that you requested last month was a report for what we're gonna see in the future from the state, particularly on SBAC testing and how it relates to the common core. The presentation you're gonna see this evening and, and why we're doing this under the superintendent's report is I want you to understand that this, even though the report's from them, it comes with my full support. I've reviewed these presentations, and I think it's very, it's, it's going to start a very important dialogue between all the boards. And this is, we're at the MEU board tonight for the middle school and high school, but we're going through all the schools in the supervisory union with. Um, beginning to begin the conversation of uh, what's changed we you know that you've heard the kneecap test you know that that's going away you know that the SBAC test is coming you know you've heard that every school because of the you know in 2014 you've heard from the Secretary of Education that every school um, uh, not just here but everywhere else did not make adequate yearly progress what does that mean what's the impact for that and that's that's what is behind tonight's presentation and uh, I, at this point, I'm going to yield the superintendent's time. Uh, I don't know if Tim, Sue, or Laura is going first, but. You will get a copy.
copy of this presentation at the end. Okay. okay. because we have copies of this. So I'm going to start with the work of Rebecca Holcomb, and who is the Secretary of Education. And she this year created a letter to parents and caregivers. And we pulled a quote from her letter, and we also have copies of her letter for you at the end as well. She said, under the No Child Left Behind Act, as of 2014, if only one child in your school does not score as proficient on state tests, then your school must be identified as low performing under federal law. This year, every school whose students took the kneecap last year are now considered low performing by the U.S. Department of Education. The Vermont State Board of Education, along with Rebecca Holcomb, created a, a resolution as well, and we pulled from that. Um, one of the remarks that was made in this document states that educators need to make use of diverse indicators of student learning and strengths in order to comprehensively assess student progress and adjust their practice to continuously improving learning. They also need to document the opportunities schools provide to further the goals of equity and growth. And this evening you're going to hear from Mr. Payne and Mrs. McGuire who are going to share the opportunities that they're providing their students with their staff in the schools. There were three indicators that she referred to, um, that were referred to in her letter to parents and, and caregivers. And she was talking, sharing Vermont trends. Trends in International Mathematics and Science Study from 2013, one of the two large international comparative assessments ranked Vermont seventh in the world in eighth grade mathematics and fourth in science. On the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the NAEP, Vermont consistently ranks at the highest levels. We have the best graduation rate in the nation and are ranked second in child well-being. The Wallet Hub, a social media company, analyzed 12 different quality metrics and ranked Vermont school system third in the nation in terms of school performance and outcomes. So the next thing we're going to do, and I actually think we should pass and go from, we're going to have to go off of these. Okay. I'll pass. Um, these guys are going to take over. Let me pass. Does it not look like we're going to be able to get this to oh, Well, I'm sorry. I, I hit the wrong button and shut it down completely. So okay. Yeah. Okay. So we got it's it's got to, the connection's gotta regenerate. So it takes a while when you get down. But everything you have in front of you now is what's gonna be on the screen, so as Laura was right, uh, as Ms. Woodrow already covered, uh, where we are is right here. This is not anything you need to look for. What this is is a uh, five year look at how the uh, school is doing. He's got to He's got to pay. His pages are individual. Uh, so you're looking at it from 2009 to 2013, going from left to right. Um, what it will show you is proficiency rate, proficient with distinction, proficient, and profi partially proficient. Uh, overall, the school is moving in the right directions. 2000, 2013, we did see a drop. Uh, this is, like I said, one test that, or one assessment that we give kids during the course of the year. Um, the next page will give you a sense of how the middle school compares to the states. State of Vermont, and this is a three year snapshot instead of a five year. Um, Ms. Boudreau already pointed out that we did not make the AYP. We joined the rest of the schools in the state, uh, not meeting our goal. Uh, a concern for me as a principal in the last three years, you can see that uh, the, thank you, sir, remind me. Uh, the percentage of per, uh, a proficient or higher, which means proficient and distinction, is also included in that, lagging behind where the state is. Um, and that's a concern as we move forward. 
Um, it is to be noted, though, that the uh, percentage for the state is also declining. So I, I can't tell you that as, you know, they're trying as we are going into the SBAC and we're seeing harder questions, um, but we are taking a look at that. I would add, in looking at this bar graph, we also assess students three times a year using a MAP test. Uh, this is an, a web-based uh, assessment in reading and in mathematics. Students take that uh, three times a year, and we have seen positives in that uh, measurement, which is sometimes uh, I feel more helpful in instruction. It's more timely, uh, and we are seeing students moving uh, in the right direction. That's a positive for a couple reasons. The map more closely uh, reflects what the SBAC expectation is going to be, which is this new assessment, new national assessment we'll be taking in the spring. Uh, specifically what the SBAC calls performance tasks. These are asking students to do multi-step problem solving within a standardized test. And within map testing, um, our students are, are improving. So yeah, we're right there. You're good. Yep. We're all set, thank you. Um, I apologize to those folks at home. The graphic on the projector now matches where we are. So map testing gives you a little bit more of the detail. These are just overall categories. And I do want to point out to folks that the percentage from 2011 to 2013, you're talking about 71% to 68%. Uh, and in a cohort of 600 students, uh, you know, we can argue that all night long about statistical um, range. Uh, on the next page, or the next slide, this is mathematics. Uh, again, this is uh, measuring students with distinction. That's your blue. Green is proficient. Orange is moving in the direction of proficient, uh, partially proficient. Um, some positive news in this. Um, you see uh, increased number of students proficient with distinction. A uh, little drop of proficient, but I think that's also, uh, it shows kids are moving up in the categories, because uh, you also see an increase in partially proficient as you move across. The next bar graph is probably the positive news out of this. Uh, Vermont is in the red, uh, the middle school is in the blue. Uh, we continue to outperform the state. Uh, again, a troubling uh, notice is that both the state and the middle school uh, achieving less proficiency as we move forward. Um, you know, again, uh, the state is moving over to the SBAC. Uh, questions, I can't tell you for sure of that. But again, when you look at the details under this with map testing, because again, map testing is for both reading and for uh, uh, mathematics. Uh, the positive news in MAP for us in the Department of Mathematics is you see many more kids moving toward that proficiency. So kids who are not yet there, who needs improvement, we are seeing growing numbers of their scores inching closer and closer to proficiency, uh, and that's a positive. And again, the MAP score is three times a year. Uh, that definitely impacts instruction more than kneecap, which is taken in the spring. You get the results in the fall, and those kids have moved on to the next grade, so a little less of a, um, an impact. <coughs> Yep. So this is these are Sue's slides. Okay. Can you go to the next one, which is the same thing, and I just think it's easier to understand and see. So this is our reading scores, and as you know, uh, with your support, we have been concentrating uh, very much on reading. Uh, the last three special educators that were hired, I made sure they were also literacy <coughs> specialists. Um, we have uh, something set up at our school, which is uh, a what the state calls a response to intervention model, where um, we have uh, kind of uh, what happens is our literacy specialists come up at eighth grade, at the end of eighth grade, they do a lot of assessments, and that depending on where those students are in reading we place them where they need to be, whether it is a direct reading instruction program to having a literacy specialist with an English teacher with some struggling readers to all the way up uh, to students that don't need that extra help that are doing much higher level uh, courses. So what, I, what I'm excited about seeing this, if you take a look at it, is uh, over the last three years, it's we're the blue 
and the state is in the red and you can see we just uh, have we were below the state average then we uh, got with the state average and now we've surpassed it so it makes me feel that what we're doing around reading is is working it's made a difference and a lot of that is what you've allowed us uh, to set up which is that response to intervention model um, any questions on that Laura, did I say what response to intervention is okay? Because yes. <laughs> I'm sure you could speak to no, it a lot. I, I think you're going to get to that more when we talk about access. Okay, all right. Uh, news isn't as uh, good for math if you go to the next one. Math is pretty flat. Um, uh, I don't want to even make the statement that the state is flat too. That doesn't matter to me. What we need to do is be bringing the math up. I know that our uh, district is now working on math and Laura maybe you can explain that it's more of a K through 8 now is working on math right it's like uh, so the, the local so we have a math curriculum we have a math curriculum now sorry, here. so we have a math curriculum now that's um, based on the common core state standards but it's our local curriculum document and we are proud to say that it's up and online if you went to the SVSU website you could find this document and we purchased, the district purchased Go Math as a, a K through 8 math resource to support the curriculum um, as the primary resource. And we're hoping over time to see um, how that helps improve student success. Because that'll only help us once the, because what I found, and I, I think Laura will agree with this, is that um, when kids get to us, they need to at least know even some algebra. We can't have kids coming in that can't add and subtract, multiply and divide, um, because that's an expectation certainly of the Common Core. What I'm going to, uh, in a future slide, is talk about my interest is setting up the same kind of response to intervention model that I, we set up for reading as we did for math. That is my one of my goals. Um, okay, the next slide. Okay, so here's the, this came, no matter where you look for graduation and dropout rates, it, it seems to be a little different. And the formulas are very complex, but why I wanted to put this slide up, according to our AYP, in order to meet the graduation rate, we had to have 86% graduation rate. Now on the a AYP uh, information that came in, it said we were 82%. Now this is a different, way of looking at graduation rate that came from the state and then I honestly don't know the difference but why I think it was important is we're going in the right direction it's a four-year uh, cohort so if you don't graduate in four years if it takes you five years you're considered a dropout even if you're in school and you finish school so that's important to understand um, but our district dropout rate if you take a look at it over the last five years it started at 8.38%, it's down to 3.89%. And then they broke it down by our special education students. Uh, it started at 10.7%, it's down to 5.51%. So we're definitely going in the right direction. What I think, uh, what I attribute that to is that, again, with the support of the board, we have built many, many pathways for different learners. For instance, we have many alternative programs, we have the Twilight program that has a job component. We have a very strong relationship with the Tutorial Center for a program called the High School Completion Program. We have a lot of on, online learning opportunities now. We have the, the tutors that you know that we've uh, hired that do a lot of extra work helping kids that need it. So I think we have built, again, um, a system of support for our kids that has made a a big difference in the in the uh, district dropout rate. Now, how they got the 54.29 when the state sent me one that said 82%, unless they add it to the five-year cohort, I honestly don't know. I, but again, we're doing a good job. It's going in the right direction. I don't want anybody to be dropping out of school until it's zero. I'm not happy, um, but we're we're getting there. Okay. This is kind of a, a goal that Tim and I talked about, uh, our purpose. 
um, that we believe that all learning should be challenging, diverse, and relevant. I think relevancy is a huge thing for students. Uh, why are they doing it? Um, and how it relates to what their future goals, whether it's in a career or college readiness. Um, we believe it's the shared responsibility of the individual, the family, the school, and the community. It lear uh, learning occurs in an environment that's safe, respectful, and collaborative. Um, and then, Laura, do you want to talk a little about SPAC? Or do you want us to keep going? Yeah, okay. So SPAC is going to be the new state summative assessment tool. Um, the difference, one of the major differences between the tool, the, the two assessments, NECAP was given in the fall. This is a summative assessment that will be given in the spring and it will be done um, as a computer-based assessment and data will be instantly available to us, which hasn't been always the case. Um, so that's a, just a little bit and we are constantly learning about um, the SBAC is Vermont's given information. They're filtering it down to our level so we can be well prepared for that. So, so for the high school and middle school, you guys will be collecting baseline information during the 2014-2015 school year to create English language arts and math goals. Um, the SBAC and the NECAP are two different assessments. So we have to start, we're starting with the baseline and then goals will be able to set. So if you guys want to talk about the next the, statement. The action. Or you want to talk about the other, other yes. Yeah. Uh, just to add quickly, uh, I mentioned in uh, my part of the presentation, we will continue to do map testing. Uh, we will be using the Chromebooks to do that. That would be great because that will have less of an impact on instruction. We'll be able to do that more quickly. But that, that will remain a three time a year testing opportunity for us. Give us very much quicker uh, feedback because kids actually get the results day of. Uh, we will continue to do common finals, and we have our formative assessments going through uh, throughout the course of the year. So many of these practices we use now, we will continue. Really, the only thing that is changing is the state uh, assessment tool, changing that over to the SPAC. Which is just one piece. Just one piece. That's just one piece. So, I mean, using these measures, I, I think, um, you know, Sue and I talked a little bit about this. You know, how do you develop a, a, a growth uh, a percentage of growth that you'd like to see as we're going to be um, taking on the new test. In the middle school, I, I do think that we can come back and demonstrate, uh, you know, have we met our goals in map testing. We can, we can do that within the calendar year even. We'll take a snapshot of kiddos here in a couple weeks and we'll do it again in the spring and we should be able to demonstrate clearly to <coughs> the board that we have in fact been moving in the, in the right direction or we still have areas to go. As I said before, the map test is starting to, this year is mirror, mir a mirror of what they're hoping the SBAC will be. It'll be interesting to see how that impacts kids sitting down and taking the test, but I think it'll be good preparation for us to understand what the challenges of the Common Core and the new SBAC test will be. And the math testing is also for ninth and 10th graders at the high school. We continue the testing. Yeah. But as Tim, as you mentioned, you asked for what the goal was that last Sentence yeah, but that's, there, that, yeah, but that's five percent is, is is very hard to, to uh, verify. In other words, if we take if we went to the math test for instance, and we found that, that the reading level was X, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to see a set of goal that and we would like to see those that reading test. I don't care if it's the reading test, or we could do it on fluency. We could do it on if, uh, students moving on to some type of further education after they graduate. But I think that the more measurable, realistic goals mm -hmm. that we can take a look at, mm -hmm. I think it's important for us to, to do that. And I I'm not pushing to try to have people fail or anything else. If we don't make it, that's that's right. that's fine too. We can work on. Well, I think they that. have set a goal. They've set up right. a, a goal of five percent increase in their math and ELA scores for this for this coming <laughs> school year from their pre and post test. So for for, for uh, okay. Yeah. Can I? Can I, in the, in the map testing, we could actually collect this data because in the map testing, it's unlike the kneecap testing, which is the whole school, it takes each individual kid, it takes a score, and then it gives the student a goal. And you can actually show, we could actually show how many kids met that goal. So you really could do what you're saying. What you'd have to do is take each kid, like all the ninth graders that took it. Okay, how many made that goal? 
Fine. That you could do that. That would be that. I, I would personally like to see that, okay. and I think it's it's right. it's good if we had that in the beginning and see where yep. we would like to see it. So we've got something measurable, quantitative. We can we can we can see. Yep. Okay. Is that a goal? I have a yep. couple. They, they're not done. They still got a few oh, more I'm slides sorry. to go. Yep. Okay, and uh -huh. I actually want to take off what they just said. That one of one one thing I pulled out of Rebecca Holcomb's work that I really like is she wants us to look at multiple measures. When you look at a child. You need to look at them from lots of different angles. So you need to make sure that you're collecting from a lot of different places so you have an accurate read on a child. And one measure might not work for every child, but having a, a menu of choices to pick from. But yes, using the data to make really good decisions and set goals is really important. And I think I heard that in what you said is, let's look at lots of measures to make sure we can set good goals for our kids and measure how they're doing. So that's the goal. And I think it's good for the students to see that goal. Yeah. Like when they get that, that readout from the map testing, you know what I'm talking about, it'll say here's where you are, here's where you should grow to, and then they can see that. I, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so let's talk about how we're going to get to that goal. These are the action steps for the high school and middle school. Okay. Hey. Want to talk? I, these are a lot of things that we went over with you in, in May. Um, uh, a lot of them are the same, and uh, you know we both have after-school supports for all core subjects. Um, I know you're familiar with our Operation Math Summer Program. It's not just for middle school and high school, but it's for fifth grade and up, and that uh, grows each summer. It's been uh, a really good program where kids can work over the summer online with math teachers uh, that are actually from the high school and they continue to work on different math problems, any student that wants to. Um, we've done a variety of professional development. Again, a lot of that professional development has been around reading and writing. And um, I think what we now need to do, at least for the high school, I think we have to concentrate on math like the whole district is. And that's um, something that the supervisory union is looking at when it, the when the request for professional development comes from me, one of the things that I'm going to push back to the principals and ask for that make sure that anything, let's be doubly sure that any request for professional development is coming along is aligning to the to yeah. these goals. So. Definitely. Right. I don't know if you want to talk about your local scoring team. We don't have that. Uh, yeah, we have a local scoring team that continues to look at you know ELA standards. Uh, I think the biggest thing for the middle school this year is uh, in mathematics is we have a new curriculum that we will be adopting and that will lead to a lot of discussions because Go Math offers so much uh, so many resources I just think time to sit and talk and share those conversations are already having professional developments already in place it will be ongoing throughout the school year um, I'm encouraged by it I think it's a good program um, but I think it's going to be a lot of work so we will be working on that this year in addition, uh, the, you know, the ELA will have to continue because um, the writing pieces and the performance tasks, those are going to be big requirements under the Common Core and how the state assesses that NSBAC. So that will continue to be a discussion in the building. Okay. Uh, we've changed how we do, especially ninth and 10th grade, um, we have changed our courses to full year courses where the kids have, they don't do it by semester. In algebra and geometry, we added additional two of them this year, um, and that's pretty much going to be how ninth and tenth grade uh, runs. Um, we added uh, two short blocks this year, which are supplemental writing supports. So now an English teacher uh, can send a student for, like, say, three days to work on some writing skills while they're doing a paper um, to get that supplemental help. Um, both Tim and I have common finals. Uh, the reason that is so important is it, do, it shouldn't be teacher specific what the kids are learning. Um, they, they have some autonomy in how they can teach it, but they all have to have those essential pieces of the courses that are taught. Um, we've updated all of our curriculum guides and I think you have also for, to meet the Common Core uh, standards and that's been a huge change. Um, ex especially for um, reading because it's, it's the, a large percent of nonfiction, which is a huge change in what types of books that we have students reading in their English classes. Um, 
And then we've uh, set up an annual all-inclusive writing competition to promote writing also. Those are some things that we've done. I know you heard most of those last May. Okay, so these are some things that uh, Tim and I have talked about. Um, we have had a lot of summer collaboration time for teachers and departments to work on curriculum because they're not just working on curriculum, they're actually changing curriculum uh, to meet Common Core standards. And um, we hope to continue that. It's a really important thing. Um, I have requested funding for Operation Math because that is a, a program that helps uh, about 80 kids, uh, 5th grade through 11th grade. Uh, I think it's very important that they continue to do math over the summer. It's a summer program. I wish we could triple that number. We invite all kids to do it, not all kids uh, follow through with it. Um, funds to buy curriculum materials, especially for kids that are, are struggling in math and aren't coming to us uh, with uh, middle school and high school skills. I think that's something we're going to be asking. And I put the idea, I think the what we did around reading and writing worked really well. I think the data shows that. And I would like to create a, a math lab model similar to our English uh, model, our literacy model, because uh, I think it could make a difference and, and pull up those really struggling students. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. So we're going to close this with going back to the work of Rebecca Holcomb and her letter to parents and caregivers. And her, her real theme is that we need to come together to innovate and improve our schools. So in her closing um, paragraph, she said, Vermont has a proud and distinguished educational history, but we know we can always do better. We are committed to supporting our schools as they find more effective and more engaging ways to improve the skills and knowledge of our children. As we have done before, we intend to draw on the tremendous professional capability of teachers across the state as we work to continuously improve our schools. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. It, from, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like the math programs during the summer is volunteer. Is that? Yes, it is. We invite everybody. I bring it to all the schools. So with that in mind, then we need to see some data and some forth for whatever so we have the numbers going up and down so we're looking at the program we got it out here is anybody taking advantage of it and in terms of that I and what we need to do hands. along that line yeah. I'm, that's what I'm thinking that we needed to do yep. that was that was one question the, the other question I, I was just all about is the, the graduation rate formula for, for yeah. what that has to be out there somewhere. I don't yeah, like it that. is. I it's just tried to, and you can't open it on the website. I found it, and but it's. I mean, I can give you the formula. I can get it, but it's over three years. It's just starting the tenth grade, ninth grade. They start ninth with, grade. If you come yes. into the high school, that's when the numbers start. So start. if you get 180 kids, that's your base. Right. That's and your base, and if all 180. If, if After four 20 years of those kids, I had one kid go on a trip overseas yeah. for a year thing, and he went down as a dropout, because you have to do it in four years. Four-year completer. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we wanted to see. We can actually yeah. look at our situation and, and yeah. tell whether we actually, you know, if you're saying we got 84% and they're giving it 54%, we know where they went and what, what's going on with yeah, the kids. I'm and so sure. when graduation time yeah. comes, yeah. uh, of the ones that are in the in the 12th grade, at this particular time, that rate uh, percentage yeah. is is not that 80 percent that you're referring to. From it, well, when they that's went to 12th what came grade. from the AYP thing. When they send me, they send you a thing with all the AYP information. You, they they said you needed to be at 86 percent. You were at 82 percent. Now, how they came to that formula? It must be a different department than from this department of Ed. And I mean, I'm sure we could get a formula. Yeah, it's know. just that that formula may be what what we're talking about here. They're looking at something way back here from starting yeah. out in the ninth yeah. grade, and then deducting and so forth. We're looking at what's in the in the twelfth grade at this time, and what we're gonna. Yeah, I didn't walk come up with any of those think, numbers. All is. the numbers came from the state. Yeah. Well, we can we can get those yeah. numbers straight, straightened out. That's not yeah. a. Does anybody else yeah. have any questions? Is the reporting on the SBAC going to be similar to that that we had with uh, the NECAP, for instance? Are we going to have proficiency and, and so on? Uh, it's going to be based on the report will come 
and it's going to say where you stand in relation to being college and career ready. That was the information we were given uh, last week at an SBAC meeting in the state, that that's kind of right now what the report's going to refer so to. So we really don't know what we kind really of reports. We really don't know. We really right. don't know. That's what it sounds like. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, but based on college and career readiness. Okay. And, and in terms of uh, feedback from that, we give it in the spring and we should get results within a couple of immediately. Yeah, it, it, we get we'll some get immediately and, and some you get in a month. A month later. Yes. Okay. Yes. And what grades are taking taking that? It's it's similar. It's at 11th grade at the high school and yeah. Three, yeah, right now I'm standing three through eight and 11. Th Three through, through eight and grade eleven. Three, three four, th five, six, seven, and eight, and eleven. And eleven. So it'll be five, six, seven, eight, and eleven. So what type of measurement will we continue to use for the high school if that's only given one grade? The map testing is we, what we use. The, same the map is, is what we'll use then yep. to. Uh, and we follow kids the same as Tim said. And that, what I like about the map testing, you're looking at individual, individual kids. Individual kids. I realize that, but it just so that we've got some. Yeah quantitative measuring that we can you know focus right. in on and see I mean there's all kinds things. of measurements we're looking at one end but I mean there you've seen that our AP scores are also very high yeah and comparatively and I think that's an important thing too like sure. Laura said there's all different students and there's all different ways we measure them well as Laura was saying and I, I certainly agree there are different ways but one of the things that I would like to see us all do I, I know I've said this a number of times is to see if we can get our literacy rate up you know, so that if, if we use the same terminology that's used in the kneecap, that we have a large percentage of our kids re reaching proficiency. And uh, that would be a, a but, great thing. Yeah. I mean, I think we're definitely going in the right direction. Oh, I do too. I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying yeah. we're not. But we, we do have You room. want them all to be. I, I, I agree. And, I, and agree. I, I want I them all to stay in school, too. Right. And I want to, you know, as we kept these kids coming in from the elementary schools, and I don't mean this to be derogatory from them at all, but it's increasingly difficult to bring up those scores if they're already two or three grades behind when they come into the, to the middle school. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's a tough battle. Not only is it a tough battle academically, but it's a tough battle socially too. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, if the, the younger we can work with these kids, uh, and I'm talking about the sixth graders we have or those that come in in the seventh grade, I, I really would like to see us put well, a, as a I, lot of effort on that. As I mentioned, okay. Tim, we, we, we view this now you're seeing a snapshot for the for the MAU. We're we're doing this. We we're in Powell the the earlier this evening. We we're in Shaftesbury with a similar presentation last week, and we will uh, continue and we'll do BSD there next round. I mean, so from the supervisory union point of view, we're committed to this at all this improvement at all grade levels, realizing that and and Sue referred to that that how her. Um, uh, her scores were affected by the increase uh, what, what was happening here at the middle school, particularly in reading. So uh, it, it all is linked together. The, our curriculum, uh, it, I'll use a small example. When they, the middle school and the high school say they're doing common exams, which is really crucial, uh, they need to be aligned. We need to align our curriculum throughout the district too so that they, because so it's, we, we can't wait for remediation at the high school. That, and I think that's, that's right. the point that you're making. Yeah. So the effort, rest assured, the effort is, is system-wide. We're, we're, we're addressing that at every level, hopefully. That's good. I would also like, you know, the Common Core is still a big question mark in my mind. And, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know that there are a number of different websites. What's the one, Ken, that's pretty good? That, that Just Common Core. Just, com just straight Common Core, that's mm -hmm. what I thought. But if anybody is interested in, in, in learning more about the Common Core, if you just go to that website, there's a, there's a lot of good information there. And it's going to be tough. And, uh, you know, we're all going to have to uh, be supportive of our administration as they try to work, work on through it. But it will be. Okay. <laughs> go on for quite a while. Are there any other comments that people would like to make? We do have an executive session. Uh, short one. If there are no other comments, I'd accept a motion to adjourn to executive session. So move. Second. All in favor? What is the reason? What's the reason for executive session? Are we coming back? Are we coming back in here? No, right we're not. No. We don't need to. No action has to be taken. Yeah. And Tim, can you get us into a room?
Yeah. The administrator. Yeah. Last time we 